Welcome back, friends, to another episode of the Performance Mindset Podcast. My name is Amy Calandrino, and after over a decade of advising business owners and families with their commercial real estate needs, I've met some influential and impactful leaders along the way. The goal of this podcast is to share some of these valuable insights from these individuals, as well as business and commercial real estate trends. If you want to grow, you're tuning into the right show. Today, I have with me Eric Gerard with me. He has over 30 years experience in learning and development, and he shares a personal journey from a new ill-prepared manager to a seasoned professional dedicated to helping others thrive in leadership roles. After a rocky start as a promoted leader of former teammates, he committed himself to overcoming his shortcomings and preventing others from repeating his mistakes. Is driven as a genuine concern for other new leaders. He aims to create environments where individuals not only survive, but thrive. And so recognizing those common pitfalls like micromanagement, I know I don't like that, <laughs> and inconsistent leadership, he aspires to maintain team productivity and morale by offering comprehensive support and training. So he conducts needs analysis, uh, immerses himself in company cultures and values, tailors the program to empower managers and leaders. <clears throat> and he has a team of experienced learning and development professionals. And he delivers the training both in person and through virtual programs like Zoom. And it's catering to groups from anywhere from like nine to 30 participants. And he's worked with renowned companies globally. And he brings a wealth of experience. The company in which he operates through is Gerard Training Solutions. So welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. So let's kind of start from the beginning because you really have a wealth of experience, but it sounds like where you kind of came from in the transition you had to make was, was not an easy one. Kind of talk about, you know, how you've gotten to where you're where you're at today. Yeah. So my career started in learning and development. It's all I've ever done is learning and development, training and development. And when I got to Silicon Valley about 20 years ago or so, um, I was curious about taking on a management position. And so I let my let my manager know that I was interested in a in a management role. And after a couple of months, he said, okay, well I've got this, I've got the spot for you. I'm going to promote you over your team members. And you're going to lead your team. And I thought, okay, great. You know, that's this going to be a little awkward, but that's okay. And then he said, oh, by the way, one of your team members is making a mess of things and I want him gone. So <laughs> I got sandbagged into doing my boss's dirty work, which was no fun. And so instead of doing what I teach in my, in my classes these days, instead of getting to know the team Instead of learning how to set goals with the team and delegating and coaching and providing feedback, mm -hmm. I micromanaged my team, just was on them like a hawk. And that did not go well. That did not go well at all. So I broke all the rules of good management and succeeded in making my team members uh, miserable and um, disgruntled. So it, it just, it <laughs> didn't go well for any of us. And I walked away from that going, you know what? Never again. Never again. So I uh, continued to, to, to check out different companies in Silicon Valley and eventually landed in Seattle where I founded my own company. And I thought my focus is going to be on helping people avoid those missteps because so often people get promoted into management positions and they're not given the training and the support they need to succeed because it's an entirely different gig going from being a great individual contributor where you're focused on tasks to going to being a great people manager. They're completely different skill sets. So my focus and my company's focus is all about helping folks make that transition smoothly and do a great job in developing and building their teams. It was interesting about having you uh, on the show is, you know, been through my own uh, leadership journey is, you know, my, my brokerage was uh, smaller and then I went to scale it. And I think, again, uh, I didn't hire the right people. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I think my office manager related it to is, you know, I was bringing in a bunch of like puppies that I felt like I could save. And I was like the no kill shelter. So actually, you know, I, I wouldn't even like get rid of someone if they weren't doing the right thing. And, 
And then, you know, that obviously was a bad thing for anyone that, uh, you know, was doing a good job. And so, you know, I uh, now have kind of evolved and, you know, have the right people and, you know, we have, uh, you know, a nice, you know, a nice size, but um, it was, it was interesting um, to have you be candid about your, you know, own journey. And, you know, my, my journey is one of authenticity where, you know, too, you know, um, I, I can learn a lot from you and my guests can learn a lot from you as well. But uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I, where were you <laughs> around a few years ago? So um, do you have an example from your early days um, as a manager um, of like a PBA project you guys are working on and you face some challenges and, you know, maybe being um, not using the tools that you had before led to some not so great outcomes? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a situation that just sticks in my head as, you know, just complete manager fail on my part. Um, I, as I, as I mentioned, I've got these two team members, one sitting in Israel, one sitting in Austin. I'm sitting in Silicon Valley. And the one sitting in Austin is the one that my boss has said, I want him gone. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, boy, this is, this is not good. So I started watching everything this person did. And one of the things that, that he did was he was running teams or running meetings with high level people in them and then copying me on the meeting notes and letting me know how it went. So he sends a note to the entire team and this is high level folks, sends a mm -hmm. note to the entire team. It's a horribly written email. So I'm nitpicking every point in the email. And then at the end of the email, he says, oh, and by the way, Hook 'em horns. Are you a are you a football fan? Not uh, NFL. Is that uh, perhaps college football? Then this is college football. Yep. So no, this is University that. of Texas at Austin. <laughs> oh this, is, this is the UT Austin team, <laughs> oh and they're the gosh. Longhorns. Oh my so gosh! So he was saying that you know he was cheering for his favorite team, the <laughs> the University of Texas Longhorns. Hook 'em horns. Well, I'm not a football fan. I had no idea what that was. It didn't make any sense to me. And so I came <laughs> down on him like a, like a, just a ton of bricks, just laid into him about it and told him how inappropriate I thought it was. And he responded, that's the University of Texas ball team. Everybody on this thread, except for you, is a fan. And they actually appreciate it when I say that. So mm. I made a complete jackass of myself, <laughs> you know, in front of him, in front of my boss. And really the, the thing to do would have been to just let that go. So that would have been um, a perfect teachable moment, you know, had we been in a classroom where I would have said, you know what, when you're coaching somebody or when you're providing feedback, check first and just double check, is this a real issue? Is it a real problem or is it just irritating to you? And if it's just irritating to you, let it go. Just let it go. So oh, that I is a great question to ask yourself. Is it just irritate? Because I do sometimes get annoyed and irritated at the things that people do. And I think that's a good thing to step back and pause. Yeah, and absolutely. Have that reflection so moment. When, whenever something comes up where I'm irritated at something, you know, the first thing I'll check is, is this irritating to me or is it a real problem? And if it's irritating to me, I just say to myself, hook them horns and just let it go. <laughs> it takes a lot of practice. It's I'm not perfect at it, but it helps. <laughs> I, I, uh, no, I have, I have different things that, uh, that I, I think of to keep me, you know, focused or mindful of, of different things I know to be not my strengths. Uh, so, so, um, what are you in your experience, uh, you know, outside of what you've dealt with are some other common pitfalls that new managers encounter and like, how do you address those to maintain team productivity and morale? There are a couple of things that I would say. The first is that new managers don't make the psychological transition from, I am an employee an individual contributor responsible for tasks to, I am a manager and a leader of a team responsible for getting things done through others. Mm. And so because they don't make that transition, they don't delegate. They hang on to everything. It's a control thing. We want to be in control. It's a very natural, normal thing. But in order to be a successful manager, you've got to let go of those, those tasks that you were excellent at in your old job. And mm -hmm. there's, there's going to be grieving because you're going to be letting go of stuff that you really, really like. But you have to so that you can free up mind space 
to focus on your team and pull back and see the big picture of how everybody's doing and how you need to optimize performance and provide coaching and feedback and delegation to really help that team thrive. So not making the transition psychologically and then not delegating are the two issues I see folks run into over and over again. And then um, what type of, do you think it's more training to, to go through that psychological evolution or does it take time? What type of things do you, what type of tactics do you see people utilize to do that? Well, the way I organize my book is kind mm -hmm. of telling. The first chapter in Lead Like a Pro is about empathy. The mm. second chapter is about making the transition. And then right away we get into goal setting and delegation. So it happens early in the book and it happens early in the course that's based on the book. So it's a combination of awareness and then practice. And so I always ask folks to spend some time thinking reflectively about, okay, where am I spending my time? Am I spending my time as effectively as I can? And what adjustments can I make? So it's not training in the fact that we're going to do some activity or exercise, but it's spending some time reading, reflecting, listening to a discussion, participating in a discussion, and then reflecting, okay, wait a minute, here's everything that I'm doing. Is that really where I need to be spending my time? Or do I need to offload some of that to some of my team and let them grow so that I can then be focused a little more strategically? Yeah. And I do think the goal setting is so important. I think uh, where I had gone uh, astray in, in you know my own leadership and managing is, you know, I'd set these and they wouldn't meet them and I'd let, I wouldn't hold account of people accountable and it was you know, almost like pretend goals. <laughs> was in, there was, there was nothing there. And I would just uh, accept mediocrity, which then ends up kind of breeding entitlement when you do actually decide like, wait a second, I can't let this continue to go and go and go. I got to fix it. But then uh, if you're not doing this continuously, then it's, it's going to come to roost in a negative a negative way. So yeah, um, absolutely. So if you set goals, well, if you use smart goals, Mm -hmm. So if you set good, smart goals and you're clear on them and your employees are clear on them, then you can always go back to them and say, okay, did you achieve this or not? Mm -hmm. So making sure that it's clear who does what, how much, and by when, and making sure that your, me your goals are specific, measurable, aligned or achievable, relevant or realistic, and time-bound or trackable – it's like, okay, did you do it or did you not? It's a binary yes, no. And then if not, then we can have a coaching discussion or a feedback discussion where I can be completely candid with you and completely kind at the same time. You can do both. Yeah. And just say, okay, you know, we, you know, I wanted this done by December 30th. It's now January 4th and it's not finished yet. So how do we get you back on track? And you can have that discussion rather than, well, I don't know. I think we agreed. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember. Yeah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. That's that's a recipe for disaster. And, and nobody wins in that scenario. So if you're clear, Brene Brown says, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. And so if you can be clear, then everybody wins. Mm, I love that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm working on my own, even just personal 2024 goals. And, uh, you know, I have like a coach and I talked about, you know, I'm going to go to the gym more. <laughs> and she's like, that's not a, that's not a goal, Amy. So how, how long are you going to work out? What are you going to do? Like, how often are you going to do it? Is that, you know, realistic with having two children and, you know, multiple companies, you know, take a look at that, like, you know, think about that. So Oh, yeah, I think it is, you know, even with yourself, like, if you don't make it smart, whether you're leading yourself or others, uh, it can lead to some challenges. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Setting smart goals in personal, personal and professional life helps a lot. It yeah. just it just makes it really transparent. This is what I'm responsible for. This is what you're responsible for. This is what good looks like. This is what done looks like. This is when it's going to be completed. And I always encourage folks, because you see a lot of goals in corporate life. You see a lot of goals where it's like, well, I'll get that done by the end of Q1. 
Well, I always encourage folks actually put a date on it because my version of Q1 and your version of Q1 might be different or, or the mm-hmm. end of Q1 might be a little different. So just put yep. a date on it. You know, when I say end of Q1, I mean March 30th uh, by 5 p.m. Like that's what I mean mm-hmm. by that's, that's when it's due. Um, and there's no ambiguity there. So just taking as much ambiguity out of the process as you can is helpful. You know, the other thing uh, that I find with goal setting too is just not to make sure that there aren't too many goals because you can almost get paralyzed. And so have you found that a specific quantity or does it depend on the volume of the project to be, you know, be helpful leading people? I've, it, I've heard some people say, you know, try not to work more on more than like, let's say pick like three rocks for per day to kind of work towards your regular goals or pick, you know, a, a few things for each area, like whether your personal or professional goals, have you found there to be like a quantity that works well for you or is it based on the breadth of the project? It, well, it depends. And mm-hmm. speaking for myself, I do better if I've got three to five goals per quarter. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, so it's not overwhelming, but they're challenging. I don't, I don't want to sit on my hands waiting for something to do. Um, I mean, these days I wouldn't do that. I'm self-employed. If I sit on my hands, I don't get paid. But, <laughs> That's for sure. But, you know, I, I want to be challenged and I want to be motivated. And to me, three to five per quarter is pretty good. Yeah. Um, yearly goals are good as well, but I tend to find that yearly goals wa- wind up in a drawer someplace. Mm. And so if I set yearly goals, I also am checking them quarterly to make sure that I'm tracking. Mm. And then I have sub goals underneath that support that. And those are quarterly or monthly or maybe even weekly goals that I'm focused on that support what I want to achieve by the end of the year. That's interesting. Yeah. So like, let's just say hypothetically, I want to shoot under a hundred in golf again, you know, next year, by the end of the year, let's just say I say December 17th, but probably breaking it down that I work up to maybe one lesson, you know, a month by the end of, by March 27th, you know, let's just say, and kind of breaking it down. Otherwise I'm going to get to the end of the year and be like, I did not shoot under a hundred again this year. (laughs) Yeah. So. Why didn't Why didn't you shoot toward a, under a hundred? What What were your goals? What were your What were your milestones? Oh, I didn't have any. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So goals yep. help with planning. Yeah, and then and, but if you have too many in one area too, then then you almost can get. But I think three to five per quarter. I like that too, and having the milestones to kind of keep you on track. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's like driving down a road and there's no directionals and it's been a really, really long time and you don't know which way to go. Yeah, exactly. So. And I've been on those roads. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. So I saw that you're a paddy open water scuba instructor and you're pursuing master scuba diver trainer. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. So, uh, and how that might even be kind of relatable to to what you do, or you know, uh, what what got you into that? So I got into scuba when I was living in Sydney, and ah. it was kind of a fluke. I I was walking along and saw a dive shop and walked in and started talking to the guys there, and they must have been really good salespeople because that was in 1998, and I'm still diving. So, oh wow. Um, I, I learned how to dive in Sydney, and when I came back to the U.S., I just continued it with my with my with my good friends, and it became a thing that was just fun to do. Um, and I decided to become an instructor because I went to Hawaii. My my family and my best friend and I went to Maui for our fiftieth birthdays. And Bill and I were diving on the Molokini Crater in Maui, and I'm swimming along, mm-hmm. going. I got to do something with this. Like I got to make this more formal. So we came back from the dive and I got on the phone and started calling dive shops back home and decided that I was going to become a scuba instructor and I was going to be teaching scuba someplace tropical by 2030. That was my goal to teach scuba someplace tropical by 2030. So that's a scuba goal and it's also an early retirement goal. (laughs) So I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, okay. I, I could get behind that. So, um, that's, that's what got me into, to the whole idea of becoming a scuba instructor was I want to be able to teach scuba in the tropics, um, by 2030. 
And the way it ties into what I do for work is two things. The first is teaching people who have never scuba dived before how to do it and exposing <laughs> them to that is life changing. When you, you know, you get everybody in the pool at the, at the beginning of the first day and they put the regulator in their mouth and they stick their head in the water and they took their first breath underwater. That's life changing. You know, people have just learned how to breathe underwater, and that is amazing. I've never thought of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. So you just see people's eyes light up. They're like, I can breathe underwater. And then you bring them through a sequence of, of skills to go from, I've never done this before, to, I've actually mastered a number of skills that will allow me to be a confident diver underwater out in the ocean. So it's that progression of skills that Patty uses that I just, I love the instructional design of it. It just makes me feel very comfortable and very confident that I could teach anybody how to scuba dive. Um, and it, it, it's what I do in the classroom as well. I, I walk people from a very broad, general, safe environment, gradually more specific until they're doing something very risky. Mm. But you don't just throw somebody in the deep end. You don't just throw somebody in the ocean when you're teaching them how to scuba dive. Right. And you don't do that when you're teaching somebody management skills either. You don't start with the hardest skill first. You don't ask them to disclose something really um, private first. You start easy in general and then move to specific. So the two fields intertwine quite well. And I bring a lot of my management development um, chops to scuba instruction Mm. And then I remember, you know, when I'm teaching people something or when I'm writing a new course, I always remember start small, start in the shallow end of the warm pool first before you go to the ocean. So it works both ways. Yeah, it was it was interesting when I was uh, getting ready for today's podcast and I saw that and I was like, I imagine that there's going to be some parallels between these two things. Um, uh, interesting enough, too, you have uh, two twin teenage daughters. And so th there has to be some life lessons along the way there, too. <laughs> I got three words for you. Hook them horns. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so my girls are 14. They are amazing human beings. They're fantastic people. Uh, I am extremely proud of them. I love, I love watching them grow up. I love being with them and they're 14. Yeah. So, so there are, there are times when I just have to say, hook them horns and walk away. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's just the thing is, is, is sometimes you need a break and you need to let things go. And I think that that also is, you know, in parallel with managing as well as like sometimes when, when a situation is too tense, take a break, go get a cup mm -hmm. of coffee and regroup, you know, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm finding that I'm getting really, um, really wound up about this topic. Can we take a 10 minute break Yeah. or can we reconvene in an hour and pick this back up? Or would tomorrow be a good time to talk about this and, yeah. and, and just revisit the conversation when people are calmer and there's less adrenaline and there's uh -huh. less emotion. And then you can have a totally candid, totally respectful discussion and get the problem solved without, without friction or without ramping up. The, yeah. The ramping up, um, you know, sometimes you see things when you're like out and about and, you know, I'm guilty of it as well. Um, I have a two and a half and a four year old. <laughs> so uh, it's very interesting, but I find that you can escalate things, just, you know, whether no matter what someone's age is, you know, I think sometimes you almost have to take yourself out of your body and then kind of look like have an out of body experience and look at like, you know, how, what am, what am I doing? Like, how is this really helping to accomplish the goals? Or yes, do we need to do like a timeout and like, okay, where it seems like, you know, we're going around and around about this. Like, let's just, you know, step aside from this. And um, yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah, you know, um, go ahead. Disengaging is, is a, a key skill and I'm still learning that. It is hard. You know, I don't know why it is. I think sometimes, I don't know if it's impatience or what it is for me specifically, or if I just want everything to be tied up in a nice, neat bow or to have, or if it's competitiveness or what it is. But yes, yeah, so it is sometimes just to put something away on a shelf and put a pin on it or whatever you want to call it, disengage. 
uh, that is something too that, you know, I have to work on. So, yeah. Yeah. And that, that again goes to, to management development and to scuba diving. You know, in most cases, the people you're dealing with have ne- never done either one of these things. Mm-hmm. You know, the folks have never delegated using a method. They've never set smart goals before, or my daughters have never done fill in the blank, or the new scuba diver has never removed and replaced their mask underwater before. And so learning patience and, and going step by step, showing people how is often the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, you, when did you write your book and when, when did it come out? What it, when was, what inspired you to do it? Yeah. So the book is called lead like a pro the essential guide for new managers. Uh, it, it launched on September 20th. Oh, nice. And it is the culmination of 30 years of L&D experience and 20 years of management development in Silicon Valley. And I just, I wanted to take all this knowledge that I've gained and gathered and put it together. And one of the things that I wanted to do was make it accessible. So the tone I chose it is, it's very readable and it's also not very thick. It's not a 400 page tome. It's, you know, about 160 pages. There's tons of references if folks want to want to read more and learn more. But a new manager can read that book and have a fairly decent idea of what they need to do when in order to lead a good team. And then the course that's based off that, I can either bring it into a company and run cohorts for, uh, for a company, or I'm going to offer it publicly. And the first public course will be in March. Uh, and I'll invite folks from around the world to come and join and uh, we'll go through the, the content together. Yeah, I, I know. I definitely want to stay in, in contact with you, too. I think um, a lot of the clients I take from startup to where they start to mature into that second state, a second uh, second stage uh, part of their their maturation, you know, as a company and uh, and then seeing then this, you know, the owner, you know, start to have all the different managers, but then the owners kind of been involved with at the beginning and, you know, then you start to, to see some of the, the, the dysfunctions that could happen without, you know, bringing in a, a professional, a big part of what I, I do, cause I do commercial real estate, but uh, I'm called beyond commercial because a lot of what I do has to like helping to put together the pieces and to help to make, uh, help to bring value to those that I serve through, you know, banks or, consultants or insurance or all those different things to, to help uh, make things like easier for them so that they can grow. And then uh, if they keep growing, then they eventually they need more commercial real estate space too. So, <laughs> so it's a win, win, win. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so definitely very interesting. Um, it, and it sounds like you're, you've been continuing to grow as well. What do you think is probably one of the most single, most important reasons for your success? Well, it all comes down to relationships. Mm-hmm. Every, everything I do comes down to relationships. So I remember when I first tried selling, I, I was it was kind of a paint by numbers. Okay, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this, and then boom, you do that. And that was not successful. So a lot of what I'm doing in my practice is really focused on building relationships, mm-hmm. getting to know folks genuinely, um, getting to know my client companies well. So whether it's an architecture firm or a tech company or another different <laughs> sort of firm, understanding that company and their culture is really important. So mm-hmm. it's not about, you know, Professor Gerard coming in to, to save the world. It's about, mm-hmm. let me get to know you really well and let me adjust and adapt my style to, to meet you where you're at. Yeah, it sounds like a one size fits one kind of, you know, solution for each company. Uh, which is, which is great. Um, I, I totally feel that, um, it was interesting. I met someone right before Thanksgiving at the gym. Uh, uh, and, uh, then I found out we were just chit chatting then come to find out she's one of the larger landowners in one of the towns that I focus uh, a lot on in here in Orlando. And then, and we just had a delightful conversation. And then she sent me a text today. Remember me? I'm going to dig out my lease for you. So I'm like, oh, yes, that's great. So, uh, no, I, I agree with you. I think uh, genuinely caring about people um, and having their best interest at, at heart. And then, you know, obviously having the, the, the experience to help 
you know, bring, you know, execute the solution is, is important. But uh, I, I find that people that have both that um, it's a, it's a winning recipe. So, well, cool. Uh, is there anything else you want to chat about today? Or do you think we covered some good ground? I think we covered some good ground. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to make sure how do people find you? What's the best way for, for someone to get a hold of you? Well, I'm all over LinkedIn. Yep. Uh, so I'm Eric P. Girard on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I post every day of the week. So there's great content there. Wow. Um, I've got a newsletter and a blog that you're welcome to, to jump onto. My website, Girard Training Solutions, has got information on everything I do. And folks can email me at eric at girardtrainingsolutions.com. Awesome. Well, I know, like I said, a lot of my clients listen to my podcast as well as, you know, other other folks uh, listen in because uh, we cover a lot of business and commercial real estate topics. So it was great having you on today. And uh, this is Amy Calendrino signing off. <laughs>